Hey guys, it's Nick with another Engineering Roundtable video. If you remember my last segment, I talked about doing an e-textiles project this time, um, sort of based on this Think Geek hoodie that uh, casts spells when you wave your arms around and sort of makes some, some lights and some sounds happen depending on what gesture you do. And I thought that was a really cool concept and I wanted to replicate that, um, but I didn't want to do the exact same thing. I didn't want to do a hoodie and I decided that uh, I would focus on sort of the the basic point of, of what the product was and, and to me that was uh, lights, controlling some lights and sensing uh, motion. So I took those two concepts and boiled them down and I turned them into uh, this project which is uh, sort of a battle bracer. It was designed to be a two-player game, and I've only got one built now, um, but it is fully functional, and uh, I'll sort of walk you through how you would play this game uh, if you had two people with two different bracers. There are two weapons and one shield, and it's sort of uh, first-person sh shooter style. It's, it's like almost like playing laser tag, except instead of a laser, I have a Zigbee module. It's all radio frequency, and you might say, well, well, if you don't have to be in line of sight to hit somebody, then, you know, what is the, I mean, how, are, how do you not just go somewhere and put your shield up? I tried to make it so that the shield would deplete over time to discourage people from doing that. And since you only have one controller and it's your whole arm, um, you, if you have your shield up the whole time, you can't attack. The way that you actually play is uh, you turn the unit on and you'll notice that one of the LEDs is flashing. And there's two on the bottom corners here that represent what your weapon is going to be. And I tried to stick to sort of the classic video game uh, weapon compromise of a rapid fire weapon that just keeps going and a charge weapon that takes longer to charge up but then deals more damage. When you flick your wrist to the side like this, uh, it switches between the two weapons and you can see this LED is blinking and when I do that this LED starts blinking instead. To fire the weapon that's engaged you just turn it to the other side. I have two different light patterns that show when that weapon is engaged. If you want to block an attack you just put your arm up like this and you can see all those LEDs turn on and then they sort of slowly drain out over time and then flash to let you know that the shield is depleted. And you can put your arm back down and start the shield over again and um, you could actually theoretically Theoretically, you could keep doing this over again and it would just stay at 100%, but of course you could get hit with something in between. That's how the game would essentially work. Two people uh, just sort of battling it out, doing this sort of rock, paper, scissors, radio frequency um, battle. This is partially an e-textiles project uh, because it is a soft project and it is sewn into it. So I have a lily pad Arduino down there and I have the lily pad um, accelerometer as well as a lily pad XB and then I have a grid of multiplexed LEDs that I built and then soldered to the board. You might wonder why I didn't go ahead and just use lily pad LEDs for all of my LEDs here. You can see I actually have 12 um, overall that make up the display. Well, the fact is, I just kind of wanted to build something big and, and weird and sort of scary looking for these. I didn't just want like a bracelet that had lights around it. I wanted some structure to it. This piece is actually Velcroed on and I can remove it. Um, it's just two pieces of acrylic that I cut out to shape and then I hot glued all the LEDs in place and then it's screwed together with standoffs so that it has a little bit of volume to it. And all the wires that come from those LEDs just come down and are soldered to the lily pad Arduino. So the LEDs are multiplexed and we'll talk about multiplexing in a minute but basically uh, all that means is that I have 12 LEDs and I'm only using seven IO pins to drive them. Also on the bracer is this accelerometer board. It's a lily pad accelerometer board. Um, basically it's an analog output accelerometer. It just gives you an analog voltage um, for each of the three axes of uh, motion. All you have to do is send those to your analog input pins and then read them off and do something with that data. This is the first time I've actually used it on the lily pad board and it's nice because once you have it sewn into the garment, relative to the to the garment it, uh, it doesn't move very much so uh, you get this really nice sort of template for gesture recognition. And then finally I used the lily pad board for the XB um, which is just an XB socket uh, and a few passives that makes it really easy to plug uh, these XB modules in. And I just have power uh, sewn in there and then I have the uh, TX and RX sewn 
um, back to the UART on the LilyPad Arduino board. We do sell a LilyPad board that has a JST connector on it. Generally, unless you're going to really be wearing this thing and throwing it around, um, this works fine in a pinch. Just take the JST connector and because of the way that the FTDI programming header works on this, um, there is a power and a ground right next to each other. Since this is a 3 volt board, I could just put this uh, 3.7 volt LiPo directly to the board and it didn't have a problem with that so I just sort of as delicately as I could jammed this JST connector up against the FTDI header and it worked just fine. The actual material is just uh, some pants that I cut up that don't fit me anymore and uh, some Velcro from the fabric store. So since I don't have a second bracer, you might wonder where this serial data is going because I am sending it out over XB. Right now I'm just capturing it using a serial capture program called RealTerm. It's a really simple uh, serial terminal and I like to use it for a lot of things because I can put it in uh, what's called ANSI. Uh, mode, so um, there are a bunch of really cool ANSI characters that control things like uh, erasing the terminal screen and moving the cursor around and changing text colors, which really comes in handy when you're debugging. I've just got my baud rate set to 9600 and uh, port 14 is where my XB Explorer is. I have an XB uh, USB Explorer set up. I'll just open that terminal. I'm going to pick up the bracer, I'm going to flick my wrist like I'm changing weapons, and you can see uh, it tells me which weapon is active. Like I said, you've got a charge weapon and you've got a rapid fire weapon. As I flick my wrist, you can see it changes that. And then if I uh, actually put my hand up and go into shield mode, it tells me the shield is engaged and it tells me what percent shield is left. Then it tells me it's depleted and then disengages the shield automatically. All of that is information that you would want to send out to another bracer so that they could work out between them where points were awarded and who got hits and what missed. So now you've seen the bracer work and uh, now I'd like to kind of go in and try to explain how I accomplished that. So first we'll talk about multiplexing. With multiplexing, uh, the problem that you're facing is you have uh, a whole bunch of LEDs that you want to drive and you need to drive each of them independently but you don't have quite enough I.O. pins on your microcontroller to address them individually. I ran into that problem because I'm using the LilyPad Arduino and uh, I already have a bunch of pins being used up by the accelerometer um, and by the XB. Multiplexing is really just um, taking advantage of the fact that an LED is in fact a diode. Um, it only lets current flow one way. And when you combine that with the fact that a microcontroller can control where the ground and where the power is on a circuit, you end up with a really powerful tool for driving a bunch of LEDs. This is your basic multiplex diagram. I have uh, 12 LEDs and they're all connected to these lines that sort of form a grid. These three lines come up and connect each of the columns um, and it connects the cathodes from each of the columns. And then on each row, I've got a line that comes across and connects the anode for each row. Say you want to light this LED right here. Well, you just give uh, this line voltage, VCC, you take this one down to ground, and you'll see that uh, since current can't flow out to this open wire that's just hanging there, it'll flow through down here and it'll have to flow through this LED and light it up. If you wanted to light up that LED and say um, this one as well, then you just put voltage on both of these lines and ground this. What happens when you want to light, say, just this LED and this LED? You put voltage here and you put ground here and this one lights up and that's cool. And then you put uh, voltage here and you need ground here. So that one lights up, but look what else is happening. You've got current coming across here, across this LED and coming down to this ground. So this LED will actually light up as well. And since you have this grounded and power here, this LED lights up. So instead of just getting these two, you end up with all four of these LEDs lighting up. The way that you avoid that is by scanning across the grid of LEDs. So in your program, what you'll do is you will uh, give this power, you'll ground whichever of these three you want these to turn on. Say you want these two to turn on, you ground those two, you leave this one disconnected, and when I say disconnected, there's actually a state that your microcontroller can put a pin in where it appears to be just disconnected from the circuit, and what that's called is a high impedance state, or high Z. To do that, you just put that pin in input mode. In Arduino, it's just pin mode, and then the number of the pin, and then input, and that puts it in high 
high impedance, which essentially just looks not connected to the circuit. This would be in uh, high impedance, and then these two would be low, and this would be high, and you've got those two LEDs going, and then you turn that off. You take this away, put that in high impedance, and then move down to your next row, and you put voltage on that, and then you light up whichever. And when you go through and you do that over and over again and you sort of sweep through it cyclically, you can do this fast enough that um, to your eye, you can't tell that they're not all lit at the same time. So essentially, you're individually addressing all of these LEDs, but you're only using seven pins to do that. So the next thing we're going to talk about is tilt sensing. Originally, the hoodie that I based this project off of does sort of a gesture recognition thing, and I never could figure out just by watching the demonstration video whether it was doing real gesture recognition or whether it was doing sort of a tilt sensing with some cleverness built in to make it seem more like gesture recognition. True gesture recognition can tell between two really similar sort of gestures because it takes this huge store of data and compares it using something uh, called dynamic time warping to find the best fit out of a out of a catalog of gestures. If all you're trying to tell the difference between is a move uh, like the ones that I'm doing where you're rotating your wrist one way or another or up and down, that's easy to do. Instead of trying to find the acceleration of the gesture across, you just sort of line up an array of orientations. All of the motions that I'm making are characterized by the fact that they're pretty extreme from the equilibrium of the sensors. If you're looking at one of these devices from the side, you sort of have a box like this, and if you're rotating it around, say, the y-axis in this example, you can imagine that there's a line sticking straight up perpendicular to the top of the device, and that's sort of your, your center point for where all your measurements are going to come from. The way that uh, the one I'm using works, it spits out an analog voltage uh, relative to this position. I'll get numbers back through my analog to digital converter on the Arduino that uh, float around 500. So 500 sort of my center point. Numbers higher than 500 are one direction. Lower than 500 is the other direction. And the reason that you get this uh, when you tilt it is because an accelerometer obviously uh, measures acceleration and we're all under constant acceleration due to gravity. So acceleration due to gravity kind of comes down through the center of the device. You can imagine as a line that sort of points down uh, straight towards the center of the earth through the device. And so if you rotate the device relative to the earth, then your acceleration due to gravity is going to be off axis with that imaginary line out of the top of the device, which produces a reading. So you can tell how far tilted something is um, by telling uh, where the constant acceleration of gravity is coming from. When I say equilibrium, I mean whatever that axis is, is parallel to the center of the Earth. The way that I characterize a motion that's intentional versus something that's just sort of me hanging out and my arm just being whatever way is that it's a really extreme number far off of the equilibrium. Basically you have a certain degree of motion that you can capture and these areas on the periphery are, are where I'm grabbing data and calling it important. If you had a graph of the orientation of all three of your axes. You could graph them across time, and this would be voltage or degrees of rotation, however you want to handle that. So you could say, well, in the Y, it basically stayed at equilibrium the whole time, but the X, you know, I tilted my wrist all the way to one side, and then equilibrium, and then sort of rocked back and forth, and then in the Z axis, maybe, um, down and then back up. This looks like a lot of data, and if you had to record all of that, it would be really rough to compare this to a bunch of graphs that look like this. What I've done is I've basically created that threshold I was talking about. And you can just cut the top right off of that graph, cut the top and bottom right off. What you really have is you have just a blue bar here and here and a red bar and then the same down here. And then if I call these uh, negative numbers and these positive numbers, then this is really low resolution data. I could split this up into an array of seven values and I can capture this whole motion right here. And that's sort of a fingerprint of what that motion looks like. And then all you're doing is comparing one array to another one. As long as your data is really low resolution and you're not trying to capture a really fancy gesture, um, it doesn't take long to 
to do those comparisons. The way I handled it in my program was like this, except instead of trying to do these long strings of, of gestures, I wanted some really quick gestures that you could sort of go, go through and just do them uh, in the middle of a game and you're not sitting there trying to figure it out and then when it doesn't work you get all mad and you're trying to do it again it doesn't work. In my code I just looked for one really extreme motion and if it's a, an extreme positive on the y-axis it goes hey he's probably looking to switch weapons and it goes into that subroutine switches the weapon and dumps back into the main loop. So let's talk a little bit about state machines. A uh, state machine is basically a way of doing a whole lot of things in your program without having to stop for long periods of time and concentrate on any one thing. By setting up state machines, you can have an Arduino sketch that's um, monitoring a whole bunch of different things, taking care of a lot of different tasks. And the way that it does that is instead of completing each task before moving on to the next one, it just does a little bit of each one at a time in the main loop. You get through a lot more program cycles in a shorter amount of time, you just do a little bit less during each of those cycles. Now on the left here you can see that I've drawn an Arduino sketch that's probably familiar to a lot of you. A basic LED blink sketch. In the main loop here you can see I'm just writing an LED high, I've got a delay here and I wait for a one second on the delay and then I write that LED low again I wait for a second and then at the end here I'm going to find out if this button is pressed by doing a digital read. If that button is pressed then I'm going to run a routine just called button. And that's one way you could do that. And it would work except for the fact that during these two delays, which are one full second long, the controller isn't doing anything. It's just sitting there. If you press a button during this one second and then let go of it, the microcontroller will never know that happened. If this sketch was actually running on something you'd have to hold the button and then after the LED turned off and then turn back on, it would have detected your button press. And that doesn't work in every application. The better way to do that is actually to set up your code in such a way so that it's always setting the state of the LED and then checking to see if the button's pressed. What you're going to do is set up a counter first. You can use the clock on the Arduino. You can do uh, one of the timers that runs from startup. But I like to just set up my own integer and increment it uh, sort of cyclically. The way that I do that is I just have an if else and the if just finds out if my count is less than 2000 which is just an arbitrary number I've chosen here to try to get the timing almost similar to what you would see in this sketch. If your count is less than 2000 then go ahead and increment that by one. If it's over 2000 then you're going to just reset the count to zero. So all this does is it makes sure that you've got a counter running so every time it goes through this loop process once uh, that counter is approaching 2000 or dumping back down to zero. You're going to use that counter to keep track of the state of your LED. Instead of just writing the LED high and then waiting for a second and doing nothing, you're going to just find out if a second has passed. So you're going to see if the count is less than a thousand. If the count happens to be less than or equal to a thousand, go ahead and turn that LED on high. If it's not, so down here, if the count is, is uh, greater than a thousand, so if it's been more than one second in this cycle, then you're going to digital write low. That in and of itself will produce the blinking you want. Because what happens is the program will dump all the way through and on count one, it'll go, okay, so it's less than a thousand high. It'll ignore this, go through count two. It'll do that until it gets to count 1001 and then it'll flop over to, um, to LED low state and it'll just go back and forth like that. Down here we have uh, the same statement from over here where we're finding out if our button has been pressed and if it has then we're running this function called button. In this sketch this action only gets executed once every two seconds. You come into the loop, wait a second, wait a second, and then read the button. In the amount of time it takes uh, to check the button once here, you can check the button 2,000 times here. So this LED could be in the middle of switching states and your microcontroller will still, still see that you've pressed the button. Where over here, if you press the button here or you press the button here, the microcontroller doesn't care. This is a really um, sort of abstract view of what the sketch is doing um, that's running on my project. The way that I have this set up is I have at the very top of the sketch a whole bunch of global variables that I've set up. Generally, you want to stay away from global variables when you're programming things, uh, say, for a computer. On a microcontroller, it's not so big a deal because you're not going to run into as many conflicts. The microcontroller doesn't have the spare room to be running a whole bunch of stuff, so you don't have 
security problems. The way that I use my global variables in this program is basically uh, as a whole bunch of mailboxes that allow all of these little pieces of code to talk to each other. So I have all these modules that sort of update things um, as I dump through the main loop. None of them take any arguments when you call them. They're just a thing that grabs from the global variables and then resubmits to the same global variables. When you start the program, it comes down into um, the first module, which is grab position. Basically grabs the data from the accelerometer and finds out if I'm in a position um, that sets off a, a certain action. When it does a, a position grab, that's something that only takes one program cycle to do. There's not any really fancy programming going on there, except for the fact that I have this box here, and I'm calling that the latch. And grab position has access to a global variable that controls this latch. The weapon changing action, for instance. Once I've done that once, I want it to wait a few seconds before accepting that same action again. Otherwise, you tilt the thing to the side and it would just go crazy. And you can't just put a delay in a sketch like this. Uh, delays are not your friend when you're talking about state machines. I really just need a way to divert the program flow away from that module for the next couple cycles until it comes back. So that's what the latch does. I have this global variable that controls the latch. This has access to it and if it detects a position that needs that latch for the next couple cycles, it just sets it. Every now and then it'll skip this module altogether. And then it runs down into the shield update module. And all the shield update module does is it controls the animation of the shield, which is basically just which LEDs are lit and it controls the level that the shield is at. So it has a series of its own timers. All it does is update. You know, keep in mind that when it goes to the shield module, it doesn't stay there very long. It just updates it once and gets out of there. So the shield module just updates these global variables to tell uh, the rest of the program where's the shield at, is the shield engaged, and uh, which LEDs to light in uh, relation to the shield. Firing module does the same thing that the shield module does except it does it for the guns instead of the shield. So it tells you if there's a gun being used, um, if it's being fired at the moment, how to handle that animation. The display module is a little bit more complicated because I needed a way to control this multiplexing action that we talked about without holding up the rest of the program. Remember that I mentioned that the multiplex display, you need to cycle through it really quickly. You sort of trick your eyes into thinking all the LEDs are lit at once. That's a hard thing to do in a program like this because the whole program needs to cycle quickly. So the way to do that is to set up a counter in your uh, display module that basically knows Every four clock, every four, not clock cycles, but every four program cycles, I need to be in this state, or this state, or this state, or this state. I actually have a fairly uh, robust display module built that has a separate Boolean variable for each of the LEDs, and they, they live in the global variables. So anywhere in the program that I want to change one of those, I can just flip it, and then once it gets down to display, it finds out which ones to set, and it sets them all. The other thing that I had to build into the display module was blinking. When LEDs blink, they need their own timer. So I created a variable just called blink state. And all blink state does is it flips its state uh, on and off every couple program cycles. If I want an LED to blink, instead of turning it on or off, I just make it equal to blink state. The display handles blinking and it handles all of the display, and then uh, once it's updated, it dumps into serial. All it does is it makes sure, have we sent out the serial message already? Is there a serial message to send out? Now the reason I don't just bang it all out straight to the serial terminal is because serial communication takes a long time. The thing to keep in mind when you have a program set up with this architecture, if serial takes a long time, it's gonna break your display module. Every time it dumps through here, it's gonna get stuck in serial a little longer and then dump through. The display won't update fast enough to trick your eyes into thinking the LEDs are all on. Best case scenario, they all look a little bit dimmer. Worst case scenario, it just kind of breaks the module and doesn't act the way you expect. So that's why I have the serial handler making sure I'm not sending out like one serial message every cycle. After that's done, it comes down here. It increments the master timer, which just keeps track of the program cycle, and then it just returns back up to the top of the loop. And it does this really quickly. So quickly that it looks like all the LEDs are on on the display module, even though the display module updates like way down in the middle of all this other stuff that's updating. So thanks for watching this segment of Engineering Roundtable. Hopefully some of the concepts that I just talked about will uh, come in handy for you and your future projects. As far as this project goes, I'm going to try and carry it out and uh, get all the way to a full two-player game. 
In the meantime, I'll get the code that I have posted up on the website so you can look through it and maybe use pieces of that uh, for your stuff. Um, as far as my next project, I really have no idea what I'm going to do, so uh, you'll just have to tune in and find out. If you have any questions, make sure to put them in the comments. Uh, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, if you have any comments about my code, uh, if you want to go, hey Nick, that was stupid, you should have done it this way, please do that. And if you just want to say, hey, cool project, do that too, because that always feels good. So uh, thanks for watching Engineering Roundtable, and uh, tune in in a couple weeks for the next one. Thanks.